Well, good morning, Sooner Baptist Church and uh, folks that we have visiting with us today. We're glad that you are here. In the uh, chairs in front of you here, you will find these Connect cards. And uh, if you don't mind, we'd love a little bit of information about you. If you have never filled one of these out, uh, it allows us a point of contact with you. Uh, we won't bug you, but we'd just like to know that you were here. Uh, and if you have a prayer request or a member's prayer request, a great place to update that. Just a couple of quick announcements, emphases on, the, uh, on your bulletin. Uh, the uh, 5 o'clock tonight, we are completing, we've done this over th four, th three Sundays previous, we're completing the American Gospel 2 film. It's been quite a journey, talking about progressive Christianity and, and getting our, our theological things together. It's been a good journey. Uh, and uh, we would, the fi final one is tonight at 5 o'clock. We do have a good Friday service. This is Palm Sunday, and this is considered Holy Week, which is a pretty important time in the life of the church worldwide, focusing on what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. We will have a good Friday service at 7 o'clock here in the worship, service, worship center. Uh, please be here for that. And the next Sunday is, of course, Easter Sunday be a great time to invite somebody, fill the building. This is Missions Month, a great way to get on mission uh, is to uh, invite someone to come with you perhaps uh, on Easter Sunday. And again, I've, I've greeted our guest that we might have in the building. We have a special guest today, Dr. Todd Fisher. Uh, he is the Executive Director Treasurer uh, for the Oklahoma Baptist. It used to be the Baptist General Convention of Oklahoma, but they have they have changed to a different moniker, public face. Uh, and I, I've known of Todd Fisher for a long time. I got to know him vicariously when I was on the faculty at Midwestern Seminary, and I was part of the doctoral studies committee. And he was presenting his project for his doctor of ministry degree. Um, and uh, so when we moved to Oklahoma in uh, 2005 to start teaching at Oklahoma Baptist University, I realized Todd Fisher is at Shawnee Baptist Church, Emmanuel Baptist Church in Shawnee. And uh, so we visited and, be and joined that church, and he was for many years there my pastor. Um, and, and so I'm glad that he is at the helm helping Oklahoma Baptist to focus on their mission. Uh, he and his wife, Jamie, uh, have three kids, Zach, uh, who I knew as, uh, when he was an o o OBU student, uh, and then also Carly and Anna. Uh, he has, uh, he's uh, taught uh, adjunctly at uh, OBU, Southern Seminary, Southwestern Seminary, uh, and at, in addition to the Doctor of Ministry degree at Midwestern, he went on to earn a, a PhD in preaching from Southern Baptist Seminary, and I think you were also on the Board of Trustees for a while there at, uh, at Southern. Uh, this is a man who's, whose life has been steeped in Southern Baptist life, uh, and I'm glad that he is with us today to, to preach for us. We are glad you're here. Let's have a word of prayer together, and then we will call ourselves into worship with song. Lord, thank you for what you've done for us on the cross. Help us to remember that today, to be convicted by it, to be encouraged by it, and to do nothing else while we're here but worship you together. We pray this in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Would you please, let's stand in his honor as we rejoice and praise his name. Rejoice in the Lord now and always. Sing it again when you rejoice. Delight in the love he has shown us. Gratefully lift up your voice. His gentleness among
come with a song of thanksgiving. Lay your request at his feet. His peace will fall upon us to guard our hearts and minds. In Christ who reigns the shepherd with his peace he is given. Praise the Lord in these times we live in. We will praise the Lord throughout every season. I am sure we have every reason to praise the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord now and always. Tell of the good he has done. Worship the Lord to remember all of the joy yet to come. The hope that birds will us, the dark and destroy. We praise that's never. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more, stronger than darkness, new every morn, our Sunday of many, His mercy is more. As we constantly go, what Father so tender is calling us home. He welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the bold. I say that His blood was the payment, his life was the cost. We stood in the debt we could never afford. Our sins, they are many.
Be seated. Well, good morning, church. It is good to gather with you this morning. I want to read for us this morning uh, from the Gospel of Luke. So let me invite you to go ahead and grab your Bibles and turn with me uh, to Luke chapter 19. It's Palm Sunday. Easter's right around the corner. It's kind of hard to believe it's already here, but it is. Let's read a little bit about this triumphal entry this morning. Luke 19, I'll begin reading reading with verse 28. When he had said these things, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the place called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of the disciples and said, Go into the village ahead of you. As you enter it, you will find a young donkey tied there on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it, say this, the Lord needs it. So those who were sent left and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the young donkey, its owner said to them, why are you untying the donkey? The Lord needs it, they said. Then they brought it to Jesus, and after throwing their robes on the donkey, they helped Jesus get on it. As he was going along, they were spreading their robes on the road. Now he came near the path down the Mount of Olives, and the whole crowd of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Some of the Pharisees from the crowd told him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, I tell you, if they were to keep silent, the stones would cry out. Let me read just a few more verses. As he approached and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, If you knew this day what would bring peace, But now it's hidden from your eyes, for the days will come on you when your enemies will build an embankment against you, surround you, and hem you in on every side. They'll crush you and your children within you to the ground, and they will not leave one stone on another in you, because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. That's a roller coaster, even in those few verses that we read, where there's this just cry out and praise to God, then that response of the Pharisees, right? But I wanted to read through to that last part just to get us back to particularly the heart of our Lord. We just finished singing about the mercy of God. Praise the Lord for his mercy, right? Jesus looked at the city and the people that he was heading towards, knowing what was coming his way, and he's heartbroken for them and for what's going to take place. And yet in obedience to the Father, in his great love that that he shows us, he went and he accomplished his purpose and he went to that cross on our behalf. So much that we have to praise him for this morning. Would you bow your heads with me? Let's pray. Our Father, we, we come this morning uh, truly grateful for the mercy and the grace that we have in Jesus Christ and in Jesus alone. Lord, we are gathered here this morning for the very purpose of, of bowing down before you and singing praises to your name. Lord, we pray, we ask in this hour uh, for the, the work of your Spirit even among us. Uh, in, in such a way, God, that you would draw us in closer to you. Father, as we sing your praises and as your people uh, show love for you and love for one another, as we open your word here in just a few minutes, Lord, we pray as well and, and ask that by the work of your spirit that you would open eyes to see 
ears to hear, Lord. Soften hearts to receive the good news of the grace that's found in Christ and Christ alone. We are here, God, because you loved us first. Because while we were sinners, you showed us this wonderful, amazing grace in Jesus Christ. And we say praise you and thank you for that today. Lord, this morning, even as we gather here, we, we know there are those among our family who aren't able to be here today, who are struggling and who are hurting and who are going through great difficulty. Lord, we lift these up in prayer before you. We pray that they would know through the presence of your spirit a comfort and a peace that truly passes understanding. And God, that in the middle of a trial, in the middle of a storm, that, that they would know that you were there with them, that they would know, Lord, that they are loved by you and by your people. God, for those, any this morning, who, who, who have walked away or who are struggling in, in doubt and in fear or walked off into sin this morning, we pray for the convicting work of your Spirit to draw your children back home. We thank you, God, that you don't just author our faith, but you bring it to completion as well. Help us, Lord, in this hour to truly respond to you in worship this morning. We ask these things in the wonderful name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. my Savior died. Down where for cleansing from sin I cried. There to my heart was the blood of the Lamb. Glory to His name. Glory to His name. Glory to to do today, we are to boast in nothing else but our Lord Jesus out of Galatians chapter 6. But as for me, I will never boast about anything. I stand convicted. I don't know about you. I boast about stuff. Not right. But as for me, I will never boast about anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. 
Let's stand in honor of what our Lord Jesus did for us. Thank him for the blood shed on our behalf.
the darkest day, Christ on the road, Calvary, try my sinful man, toward and meet in the end, nailed to a cross of war. There's the power. sung our praise. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the power of it to cleanse our lives, to bring light where there's darkness. Lord, speak to us through, our, through your word today. May we be better believers, better disciples, because we've been here and worshiped together and we've heard your word and we have been convicted and responded. We worship you, Lord. We 
pray these things in the name of our Savior Jesus. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. my obituary at my funeral uh you know here's a guy who did this and he did that and uh so i don't i'm not dead yet i don't i don't think but uh uh thank you for that and, and pastor john thank you so much for inviting me here today i'm very honored to be uh here uh, at your church uh, i want to bring you greetings on behalf of your fellow sister about 1736 southern baptist churches in the state of oklahoma uh, that's a lot of churches. A lot of people kind of raise their eyebrows when they hear that number. Uh, but we've got churches uh, all the way out west. Uh, in uh, we, ha- we have a church in Kenton, Oklahoma, in the very tip of the panhandle, uh, in the mountain time zone. Did you know there's part of Oklahoma in the mountain time zone? And uh, all the way out there, all the way down to southeast Oklahoma, you name it. Um, we've, we've got a wonderful, great variety of churches. Uh, a little interesting fact that you might be interested to know is of those 1,736 churches, uh, 90% of those churches have 150 or fewer on Sunday morning. So we are a convention of small churches, uh, but that doesn't matter. Our size doesn't matter. The budget doesn't matter. What, what makes us unique and distinctive as Southern Baptist is something we call the cooperative program. And just about all those churches are contributing some kind of portion or percentage of their undesignated receipts to this common pool we call the Cooperative Program. Uh, Next year, the Cooperative Program will turn 100 years old. And so for about 100 years, Southern Baptists have learned that we can do more for the kingdom of God when we work and partner and give together than we can by ourselves. So I want you to think about uh, what the Cooperative Program is funding. And uh, your church gives a percentage of its undesignated receipts to the cooperative program. So your church is supporting it, which means every time you give to your church, you are also giving to the cooperative program, which means every time you give to your church, you are giving to just more than your church. Let, Let me tell you what the cooperative program is supporting and thus what you are supporting every time you give to your church. Uh, We can start uh, right here at home. So the state convention keeps a part of that cooperative program. Uh, We fund things like a little camp down in Davis, Oklahoma, you may have heard of before, called the cooperative pro- called the Fall- called Falls Creek, which is funded by the cooperative program. I say the cooperative program too many times. Uh, by the way, I want to tell you something. Last summer, we saw a record number of students, over 2,600 students committed their lives to follow Christ at Falls Creek last summer. Isn't that amazing? Uh, Cross Timbers, right down the road, is our children's camp that talks about missions and and we talk about discipleship and share the gospel with them. Right here at home, Cooperative Program is helping to support 40 Baptist collegiate ministries all across our state. 40 campuses have a BCM, and we are are sharing the gospel and discipling uh, college students, which I don't think we can talk about just how important that is today. And then also, Cooperative Program is helping to fund the Baptist uh, Disaster Relief here in Oklahoma. Men and women in, uh, in those yellow hats and shirts that show up after a tornado or a fire or a flood, and they help these folks free of charge, and they're telling them about the love of Jesus and meeting their needs. You're also helping to support things in Oklahoma, like Oklahoma Baptist University. Uh, you're helping to support the Oklahoma Baptist Children's Home. You're helping to support Baptist Village Communities, which is our retirement centers all across Oklahoma, and also Water's Edge, which manages all of the assets of our affiliates. So that's a whole lot of things, right? But we're not yet done. Uh, We send a good portion of the cooperative program that we receive from churches nationally, and half of what they receive goes to the International Mission Board. So let me tell you, just to park on that for just one second, uh, probably your church here, maybe a church this size, you might could fully fund one family overseas. But through the cooperative program, overseas right now through the International Mission Board, we have 3,600 men and women and their 2,700 children who are currently serving on the International Mission Field. And the only way we can do that is because we partner together through the cooperative program. 
Through the North American Mission Board, you're also supporting that, planting hundreds of churches every year in chaplaincy work, helping to support our six Southern Baptist seminaries. And uh, I, if, you, if I had the time, I could keep talking. But that's a whole lot you're supporting, right? And that's what's really great and what's really re- unique about the cooperative program. So I just want to come and say a heartfelt thank you to your church, the Sooner Baptist Church here, and to all of you for your sacrificial giving in helping to advance the gospel all across the globe. So thank you for that. Uh, now, you did not come to church this morning on this Palm Sunday to hear a stump speech about the cooperative program. Uh, You were getting bored with that. In fact, I might have gotten a little bit bored with that. But I just want to share a message from God's Word. Not necessarily a Palm Sunday message, but it's a passage of Scripture in Matthew's Gospel that comes right before Palm Sunday. So if you want to take your Bibles and turn with me to Matthew chapter 20, if you'll just open them up up to Matthew chapter 20. Uh, I'm going to read beginning in verse 20 in just a moment, but if you'll give me just a second here, I want to set this passage of Scripture up for you. When we read this passage of Scripture, you're, you're going to see that what's being talked about here is what makes you great. Uh, a woman is going to come up to Jesus with her two grown sons, and she's going to say to Jesus essentially, Jesus, I want you to make my boys great. I want one to sit at your right hand, and I want the other one to sit at your left hand when you come into your kingdom, and I want these boys to be great. I want them to have power, and I want them to have position. And one of the most fascinating things about this passage of Scripture is what you will not read in it. Now, you would think that if a woman came up to Jesus and said, right, now, Jesus, I want my boys to have power and position. I want my boys to be great. You would think that Jesus would kind of rebuff her for that. Hey, that's not what following Jesus is about. But one of the things you'll notice in this passage is Jesus does not rebuff her for that. In fact, Jesus is going to say to her, oh, uh, you want to be great? Wonderful. Be great. But here's the catch. Your definition of what makes you great and my definition of what makes you great are two very, very different things. Now, one of the things that I want you to do as we think about this passage in our, our world today, I want you to, you're going to see the word great or first in here a couple of times. But I think you could easily insert some other words for the word great. You could insert the word identity, meaning, purpose, value, worth, because that's really what's at stake here. There's going to be a mom and two boys that want to find their identity. They want to find their meaning, their worldview, their purpose, their value, their worth. They want to find it through power and position and earthly things. But Jesus is going to tell them that's not where you find identity and purpose and value and worth. You don't find it in anything the world has to give you. You only find it in a relationship with him. So here's an, here's an interesting statistic. I think you will find this interesting. Since the year 2010, so about the last 13, 14 years, listen to this, there have been almost 10,000 books written and published with the word identity in the title of that book. Is that not fascinating? Now, what does that tell you? That tells me that we live in a culture and a society today that's in an identity crisis, We kind of want to, we we want to know the answer to life's biggest questions. Hey, how did I get here? Is there really a God who who created me or am I the product of billions of years of just random chance and mutation? Uh, Now that I am here, what is my identity, purpose, value, meaning, worth for life, my worldview? And one day when I die, and by the way, I checked again this morning, still the mortality rate for all human beings, 100%. Unless Jesus comes back, you're going to die, and you're going to stand before God as your judge. And so the big question is, when I do die, will I stand before God as my judge? Is there going to be something else after death? Now, I'm just an old kind of biased Baptist preacher, I guess, but uh, I think that the only resource that adequately, truthfully answers all of those questions, I'm holding it in my hand. I don't think the world gives us adequate, truthful uh, quest- answers to those questions. So, here's here's what we're facing with then. We're we're dealing in a world today in this identity crisis, truth crisis. Now, I'm just going to say, 40 years ago, when I was a teenager, the world was very different. 40 years ago, even the secular culture 
still derive the framework of how society should work, what we call metaphysics, how things should go. We determine that from a transcendent source, meaning God in the Bible. Even, even secular people, even lost people, you know, it's, hey, a, a man marries a woman, uh, there's two genders. You know, when I was a teenager, we understood our gender from our physical biology. But now today, that ship has sailed. And today, for the most part, our culture and society does not understand truth and identity from a transcendent source. It understands it from me, from self, and how I feel about things. So that means truth is always fluctuating. Now, I see some young people sitting in this room. And man, I I always want to say this when I see young people listening to me speak, and this is for all of us as well, but here's the thing, especially our younger generations, they have bought hook, line, and sinker a lie that says to them that truth is something you create. You create it based on how you feel about it. Uh, Hey, are all your buddies doing it? Well, then it must be true. Does that make you feel good when you do it? It must be true. Did you read about it on Facebook or Instagram or Snap? Well, then it must be true. But that is a lie. Truth is not based how you feel. Do I feel like a man or a woman today? Do I feel like a cat or a dog today? Truth is not something you create. Truth is something you discover, and you discover it in the Word of God. As sinners... We cannot be trusted to know what is true and right and wrong. We need God who is perfect, who created us, to tell us what is true and right and wrong. So that's what's at stake in this passage of Scripture, and it's really what's at stake today. Where do I get my identity? Now, let's, let's think about that then, because we're going to see the word great in here. Uh, how does the world think about that? The world kind of views that based on how you feel. Um, according to the world... What makes you great? Uh, Can you dunk a basketball? We're in the middle of March Madness right now, right? Can you dunk a basketball? Then you're great. Can you throw a touchdown pass and win a Super Bowl? You're great. Can you win an Academy Award? Can you record a Grammy-winning song? You're great. Do you have a lot of degrees on the wall and a lot of titles? You're great. Do you have a lot of zeros in your bank account? Some of you may say, I have a zero in my bank account. Well, then you're great. So here's the thing. I want to strike a pose for you, all right? Now, not because I got any muscles to show. But this is the world's definition of what makes you great, what gives you identity. Do you have money? Do you have power? Do you have position? Do you have all these abilities? Then you're great. Well, when I get to the end of the message in a few minutes here, I'm going to strike a different pose for you that Jesus did that really shows you what true greatness is. Now, let me, let me just say this real quick story to kind of, before we read the passage, just to really set us up for it here. Um, when when, when I, I pastored Emmanuel Baptist Church, as Lisa said, in Shawnee for 19 years, and uh, uh, when I was there, OBU started back up its football program, okay, uh, back in 2013. It was really good. Now, when I was an OBU student myself back in 1900, none of your business, um, we, we, had these, uh, we, we had these t-shirts that said, Oklahoma Baptist University football, undefeated since 1945. Now, that was technically true. We were undefeated, but we hadn't played a game since 1945, right? Because can, they canceled it after World War II. And in 2013, they started it back up. We played our first game. We lost, and we had to throw those shirts away. It's kind of sad. Well, one of, my privileges as the, one of my privileges as the pastor at Emmanuel was I got to be the football coach's chaplain. So I did their Bible study every week. And the football coaches at OB, they had this little story, and they loved to tell it. They thought it was so funny. I don't know if you'll think it's funny, but it really fits our, our passage here. Here's the story. If you don't know, a college football coach, that's a, 20, that's a 365 day a year job, okay? Because when the season's over, they go out and recruit all their players. So the season's over, and, and this is the story. And the head coach calls in all the assistant coaches and says, all right, guys, y'all are about to hit the recruiting trail. You're going to be in these kids' high schools and you're going to be in these kids' homes. He says, before you go on the recruiting trail, I want, to, I want us all to make sure we're on the same page about the kind of player we want for our program. 
And so all the assistants pull out the pen and paper. All right, yeah, coach, tell us what kind of player do we want for our program? And the head coach says, you know, there's that kind of player that when he gets knocked down, he just stays down. And the assistants are like, yeah, coach, we don't want that kind of player. Yeah, and, and, and then there's that kind of player. He gets knocked down, he gets back up. But when he gets knocked down again, he stays down. And the assistants are like, yeah, we don't want that player either, coach. And the coach said, yeah, but then there's that player. He gets knocked down, he gets back up. He gets knocked down, he gets back up. I mean, every time he gets knocked down, he gets right back up. And the assistants are like, yeah, coach, that's the kind of player we want for our program. And the head coach says, no. He says, I want you to go find me the guy knocking everybody around. (laughs) That's what makes you great. So now we spend a little, maybe too much time on the world's definition of greatness and identity. Let's read what Jesus has to say. Matthew chapter 20 beginning with verse 20. Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came up to Jesus with her sons, and kneeling before him, she asked him for something. And he said to her, what do you want? And she said to him, say that these two sons of mine are to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left in your kingdom. And Jesus answered, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink? And they said to him, we are able And he said to them, you will drink my cup, but to sit at my right hand and at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared by my Father. Now, verse 24, when the ten heard it, they were indignant at the two brothers. But Jesus called them to him and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Even as the Son of Man came, not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now, I want to give you, if you like to jot things down, I'm going to give you three simple takeaways from this passage of Scripture, okay? Here's the first one. The first one is this. Don't misunderstand what makes you great. Or if you want to phrase it like this, don't misunderstand what gives you identity or meaning or purpose or value or worth. So we see a gross misunderstanding of that from the folks in the story of Scripture. Now, I don't know why Matthew doesn't name them, but they're easy to name when you look at the other Gospels in the context. The woman is Salome, and her sons are James and John. Who al- the sons of thunder, who along with Peter are part of the inner three of Jesus' disciples, right? And here's an interesting thing that just kind of shows you how they misunderstand all of this. And really what I think you'll see in this passage is it's just, it's, it's just full of the selfishness of these folks. So, for example, you got James and John in the inner three. And if you look across the page or down the page or the next page, what is Matthew 21? Matthew 21 is the triumphal entry. It's Palm Sunday. So here we are. Now, what does that tell you? (laughs) What that tells you is not only James and John being of the inner three, they should know better than to think that identity and purpose and greatness comes from power and position. Not only should they know better being that close to Jesus, but we're at the end of his ministry. The triumphal entry is coming next. Now, if we were at the beginning of his ministry, we might just, these guys just been following Jesus for like two days, well, we might just give them a good old Oklahoma, bless your heart. You know, bless your heart, you just haven't been with him longer. These guys should know better. For three years, they've been with Jesus now, listening to him, and they still think this is how it is? Now, uh, by the way, some of you might be looking at me like, oh, great, (laughs) pastor brought a guest preacher in here to preach about humility, and I do not need to hear a sermon about humility. I am the most humble person I know. <laughs> so let me, let me just kind of, let me just say this. If two people like James and John could get the ways of the world inverted with the ways of God, so can you and I. We got to be careful. And I'm going to tell you right now, if you think, oh, that passage of Scripture, I don't need that. It's about humility. I don't have to worry about that. Oh, this passage of Scripture, that's about being faithful to my spouse. I don't have to worry about that. I'm going to tell you something. Every word of Scripture is for you and me to apply and obey. And here's the thing. If you ever come to anything in your life or anything in the Word and you say, oh, (laughs) 
I don't have to worry about that. That would never happen to me. You're already in trouble because you've let your guard down. So you see the misunderstanding here. Here's another way we see their misunderstanding. Look at the verses right before the ones we read. Look at verse 17 of chapter 20. So in verse 17, Jesus is going up to Jerusalem. Man, they're on their way. Palm Sunday's coming. He took the 12 disciples aside, and on the way he said, See, we're going to Jerusalem. The Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and scribes. They're going to condemn him to death. They're going to deliver him over to the Gentiles, be mocked and flogged and crucified, and he'll be raised on the third day. Now, if you like to keep score of this, here's something interesting. In Matthew's gospel, Matthew 20, 17 is not the first time Jesus predicts his death. It's not the second time he predicts his death in this gospel. It's the third time. And here Jesus says to these men, he says, hey guys, uh, I love you so much. We're going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to die this horrible, violent, painful, ignominious death for you so that you can be right with God. I'm going to do all of this that really should be happening to you. I'm going to go through all of this just because of my love for you. And do you know what their response to Jesus is? Their response to Jesus is basically, oh, okay, Jesus. Oh, hey, by the way, what's in it for me? I want to sit at your right and your left. You see the selfishness here. So, man, they're just, they're missing it. So look right in the text that we've read now, and you see where else they misunderstand. So look right here about uh, verse 21. Look in the middle of 21. So Salome says, hey, Jesus, will you do me a favor? He says, what can I do for you? And she says, look at verse 21. She says, say that these two, now just stop right there. Don't miss this. You catch this? Say. In fact, in the original language, it's a very strong word. Your English translation might translate that word command. That's really what the strength of the word. Now, did y'all catch this? <laughs> Here's Salome. She comes up to Jesus, the Son of God, God in the flesh, and she is bossing him around. She is telling him what to do. Now, Jesus... Command it that my two sons are to. Now, friends, I don't want to come here today and get all hellfire and brimstone and be that kind of guest preacher for you, but put your eyes on my eyes. I'm going to tell you something just as plain and transparent as I know how to tell you. You ready? If you ever find yourself in a place where you are telling God what to do, that's a bad place to be. I am not here to tell God what to do. I am here to obey what he tells me to do. That's how it's supposed to work. I'm not here to put truth and meaning into this book and make it say what I want it to say. Uh, I am here for this book to tell me what is true. Now look at the second thing. She says, say, command that these two sons of mine are to sit in your kingdom. Now I'm going to take a minute and sit. By the way, this has been very unique for me. Sometimes I drive up to three hours on Sunday morning to get to where I'm preaching. My house is 10 miles from here. It was great. Now, she says, Jesus, here's how it's going to go down. You're going to make it where my son sits in your kingdom. Now, when I sit, what am I doing? Uh, let me help you. Nothing. I'm not doing anything. Now, don't miss this. I think what she's saying to Jesus is when she says, now, Jesus, I want my boys to sit in your kingdom. You know what she's actually saying to him? She's saying this. She says, now, Jesus, when you come into your kingdom, by the way, your kingdom, probably Matthew tipping us off that they still think Jesus is the military conquering Messiah that's going to come liberate them from Roman oppression. He's going to pull the sword out in a minute. And Jesus, when you become Grand Poopa, CEO, Chief and General, what she, to put it in our vernacular, you know what she's really saying when she says right and left for us to understand? What she's really saying is, hey, Jesus, when you become the president and you liberate us from the Romans, I want one of my boys to be vice president and I want the other one to be secretary of state. Position, power. But when she says, I want my boys to sit, you know what she's really saying? She's saying this. She's saying, Jesus, I don't want my boys to serve in your kingdom. I want them to be served. And you say, where do you get that, preacher? Got it from the end of the passage. When Jesus says, the Son of Man, watch, the Son of Man did not come to sit and be served. No, he came to serve 
and to give his life as a ransom for me. I think Jesus uses, he's building off of her words when he says that at the end. So she's saying, Jesus, hey, uh, I want my boys to be pampered. I want my boys to be catered when they follow you. I, and friends, how wrong that is. Now here's the big question. The big question is, why in the world is she treating Jesus like this? Why is she bossing him around? Why does she want her boys to live in the lap of luxury and all that kind of thing? Uh, here's my stab at it. When you look at the context here and you just kind of see the selfishness pervading in this passage of Scripture, I think that she thinks that Jesus owes it to her boys. And you even see that when the ten show up in just a minute. He said, what do you mean, preacher? I think what she's saying, and now Jesus, my boys have been with you for three years, night and day, thick and thin, praise, adulation, condemnation. They've been with you through it all. In fact, Jesus, my boys gave up their livelihoods to follow you. And so Jesus, because everything my boys have done for you, this is what you are going to do for them. One more time, I don't want to get all hellfire and brimstone. Put your eyes on my eyes, and I'm going to tell you something again, just as plain as I know how to say it. You ready? God does not owe you a thing. In fact, I go one further. If God gave to us what we deserved, none of us would want it. I'm grateful for his grace. How about you? Now, some of y'all might be looking at me going, oh, preacher, you can move on. I would never treat God like that, like he owed me something. Or, oh, oh, boy, I've been a pastor for over 30 years. I know how church folk can be. And the cold, hard reality is this is exactly, in a functional sense, the way a lot of Christians treat God. Hey, God, I've been a Christian for 50 years. I've been a deacon for 40 years. I've been a Sunday school teacher for 30 years. Hey, God, there's no telling how much money I put in the offering plate at church. There's no telling how many diapers I've changed in the nursery. There's no telling how many meals I've served and floors I've swept and noses I've wiped. And so, God, because of all of these decades long of everything I've done for you, here is what you are going to do for me. You're not going to let my spouse die of cancer. You're not going to let me have a prodigal child. You're not going to let me lose my job. We tend to think sometimes, because everything I've done for God, He owes it to me that I can live my life being served rather than serving. But do you all see what comes next in this passage that was so interesting? What is Jesus' response to that? Oh, you think I owe it to you? For you to sit and be served. What is Jesus' response? Jesus' response says, it's kind of odd. Jesus' response says, oh, are you able to drink the cup? Now, what is the cup? Well, remember the night before he's crucified, Jesus is praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. And one of the things, in, in fact, according to John, he is praying with such intensity that his sweat is like drops of blood. And one of the things that Jesus prays is he prays, Father, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me. What is the cup? The cup is the suffering. It's the hardship. In a full display of his humanity, Jesus, <laughs> Jesus just says to the Father, hey, you know, Father, dying on that cross tomorrow doesn't sound like a real fun thing. Boy, if there's any way we could get around that, that'd be great. But he knows there's no other way, and he does it. Friends, here's the reality. The reality is, when you follow Jesus, it's not all about you sitting and being served and getting everything you want because he owes it to you. No, we follow Jesus on his terms, not on our terms. And the reality is, when you follow Jesus, there are going to be times when he, he allows you to drink from the cup. And you know why we have times of suffering in our lives? Because if we're honest, Many times it's in those times where we're drinking the cup that we grow closest to God, that our faith is strengthened the most in God. And so that's what it's like to follow him. Now, here's the second thing real quick. The second thing is, uh, as we've already said, 
So don't misunderstand greatness. The second thing is greatness, power, position, identity, greatness, identity, uh, 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 purpose, meaning it doesn't come from power and position. So it doesn't come from this. It doesn't come from right and left and all of that. Uh, so the, 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 the ten show up, right, in, in verse 24. <laughs> And it's very strong words again. The ten show up, and, and they're indignant. I mean, the word is so strong. It's like they're spitting mad. They can't even see straight. And so what, do you see what, do you see what happens here? Mom and the two boys have waited for the other ten to be distracted, and they've gone to Jesus on an end around. This is a power play. This is how I know every person in this passage is a Baptist, because this sounds like a Wednesday night business meeting. And uh, it's, a, it's a power play. They're, hey, they're gone. And hey, well, first come, first serve. We're going to ask Jesus first, and he'll have to give you vice president, secretary of state. And the ten show up, and the ten are like, hey, why? Well, I deserve to be vice president too. And I'm sure they said it in a whiny voice, just like that. Now, if I'm Jesus, I just hit all 12 of them with a lightning bolt right here. Bang! Father, give me 12 more. Three years, and this is the knotheads I get, and this is what they still think. Fortunately, Jesus is not me, <laughs> and I'm not like Jesus on this. And Jesus, instead of killing them all, huddles them up and says, hey, guys, let's have a little teaching time here. So 25. Calls them together and says, hey, you know the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them. They're great ones exercise authority over them. Here's how the world does it. Here. But he says, this shall not be so among you. So the world thinks, the rulers of the Gentiles, right, the great ones, they think it's about this. And then verse 26, aside from verse 28, might be the most important phrase in the whole passage when he says, it shall not be so among you. So here's what Jesus is teaching him. Guys, guys, y'all think what gives you identity and meaning and purpose and value and worth and all that is through what the world tells you, right? But what Jesus says is, man, anything the world gives you is just going to end up empty for you. The only thing that really is eternal and lasting and true is to turn away from that and to die to yourself and to follow me, Jesus says. I'm the one that gives you these things and gives them to you eternally. And so this is what he's saying when he says, it shall not be so among you. Listen, you've been in church a long time. You've heard a thousand sermons that say the ways of God are different than the ways of the world. That's true. But this verse, this phrase takes that one further. Not only is Jesus telling the guys in this passage the ways of God are different than the ways of the world, what he's saying is the ways of God are also better than the ways of the world. Listen to me say this to you. There is no one, there is no thing, there is no ideology or philosophy greater than Jesus Christ. And if you try to fill your bucket, you try to get identity and meaning and worth and value and purpose from anything other than Jesus, eventually it will turn into ash in your mouth. Trust me. So I'll tell you this real quick story. I'm probably preaching too long. I'm going to tell you the story and wrap it up, okay? Let me give you the illustration how that works when you, when you think it's through this, okay? Now, y'all seem like nice folk. Uh, I'm going to let my hair down. I'm going to tell you something not a whole lot of people know about me. Y'all ready? Uh, I'm going to share with you the moment I reached the pinnacle of greatness in my life. I mean the moment when I hit the greatest great of my life. You ready? Here it is. It, it was the moment when I became the captain of the safety patrol in sixth grade at W.A. Porter Elementary. Some of y'all are laughing. Y'all don't understand. No. Huh. Oh, it's greatness. Here, here's what it meant. It meant I got out of class 15 minutes early, and I walked down to the office, and they had that big counter in the office, and they had my orange vest that said safety patrol and the handheld stop sign. And as captain, I got to carry the whistle. And as captain, I didn't go to that back intersection where like three parents picked the kids up. Oh, no, I went to the big front intersection down here where all the parents went, right? And, and I would walk down, I'd put all my garb on, and I'd walk down just like this from the front door of the school all the way down to that front intersection, right? I thought I was the greatest thing in its length sliced bread. And do you know why, as my little sixth grade 11-year-old mind thought I was so great? Do you know why? Because in this position, I got to tell the parents what to do. 
They had to obey me. I'd walk out in that intersection and hold up that sign, and they had to mind me. Whoo, I thought I was great. Some day, I did that in like three weeks. Some days I'd hold that stop sign up, and if I was feeling salty, I'd put my other hand up like this, right? And I'd have that whistle in my teeth, right? So I'd do that for like three weeks. Boss and parents around think I'm so great. And then one day this happened. One day, this big old gaggle of kindergartners, first graders all come down together. I don't know why they were doing that all together, but bless their heart, kindergartners don't have very long legs, so they can't walk very fast. And they're just toddling across the intersection. And I'm standing here, come on, kids, it's okay. The parents have to do what I tell them to do. You're safe. Come on. Now, I'm 11. I don't know come here from Sikkim. And what I do not realize is that I have held up the traffic for like four or five blocks. Letting all these little kids cross the street. Finally, the mom in the minivan at the very front of the line, finally she'd had enough. And she rolled her window down. Yes, this was long enough ago. That's how you rolled a window down in a car. She, she rolled her window down, and she did this exactly like this. I'm not kidding. She sticks her head out the window, and she goes, hey, who do you think you are? Now get over there and let these cars go by. And when she yelled at me like that, I melted into a puddle right in the middle of the street. Now I walked, all right, maybe back, kids, maybe I can't tell the parents what to do. <laughs> you know why I tell you that story? If you try to find your identity, your purpose, your meaning, your value, your worth, your greatness on anything the world has to offer, you will eventually end up as a puddle in the middle of the street, and really worse. So friends, we only find that from him. So the last thing very quickly is this. Well, where do I find greatness? Where do I find identity and purpose? I do what Jesus did. And what did Jesus do? He says, hey, if you want to be great, go for it. Be great. But if you want to be great, you're going to have to be a servant. If you want to be first, if you want to be great, you're going to have to be a slave. And how do you, how does that work? Verse 28, because the Son of Man came and that's what he did. He didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. He didn't come thinking God owed him stuff. He didn't come. He came with this humility. This. So here, here's what he did. Y'all remember this? Jesus did something else the night before he was crucified. He got those 12 guys in a room, got them all around the table. He fed them a little bit of supper. And after he fed them supper, he got up from the table, and he took off his outer cloak, and he got a towel, and he got a bowl, and put water in it. And Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, who created the universe and all 12 of these men with a word, got on his hands and knees, and he washed those gross, dirty feet of the disciples. The world tells you this is where you find identity and greatness and meaning. Jesus says you find it right here. That's a different pose. How do I get from here to here? I die. He died for us. I got to die to myself. I got to die to ever thinking God owes me this or die to thinking that following him means I get to be pampered and not have to drink the cup. I got to die to thinking that I'll fill my bucket through money or power or position. I got to die to all of that. I got to turn from all of that, and I got to follow him. And so the reality is, one of the linchpins of Paul's theology is Paul basically says, the moment you come to faith in Christ, you basically crawled up on that cross and you died with him. But here's the beauty. He gives you life not just a better life, not just an improved life, not just kind of a tweaked life. He gives you his life, and he lives his life through you. I die to myself. You know, Paul said it, I think, several places, but most poignantly in Galatians 2, my paraphrase, hey, everybody, I'm alive, but it's not me that's alive. It's Jesus living his life through me. We have to come to that place of brokenness, following him on his terms. And then we'll find identity and purpose and greatness. Uh, one of the first mission, foreign missionaries, international missionaries in the modern church age was a man named James Calvert and his wife. Calvert and his young wife, they were in their 20s, young people, lived in England. They felt God called them to be missionaries in the Fiji Islands. 
Uh, the problem with the Fiji Islands in the 19th century in the 1800s is the Fiji Islands were inhabited by cannibals, very dangerous. And yet the Calverts felt called there. So as the story goes, in that long ship ride from England down to the South Pacific, somewhere in that ship ride, the captain of the ship gets wind of what the Calverts are going to do, and it really disturbs him. He feels like he's delivering this nice young couple to their death. <laughs> so he goes to Calvert, and he says, hey, I understand you're going to the Fiji Islands. And uh, he says, you understand it's inhabited by cannibals, pirates, rum runners, very dangerous place. And Calvert said, yes, but God's called us to go there as missionaries. And the captain would go to him again. Every time the captain would go to Calvert, captain, Cal Calvert would always say, God's called us here, God's called us here. So as the ship gets very close to the Fiji Islands, Finally, the captain just goes to Calvert. He's really distraught. And the captain goes to Calvert and finally just says it without mincing any words or tiptoeing around it. And the captain looks at Calvert and he says, listen to me, I'm begging you, if you and your wife step foot on that island, both of you will die. And Calvert looked at the captain and said, sir, with all due respect, my wife and I died before we left on this trip. That's the secret to greatness, purpose, identity. Die to yourself, not here, here. And you will find life that's really, really abundant and full now and for eternity. Let's pray together. Father, I want to thank you so much for uh, this passage of Scripture, God. How rich it is and the wonderful things we learn from it. Father, I pray that today your spirit would just speak to us and apply this text to our hearts. I pray, Father, for anyone that may be here this morning who is still trying to find identity and purpose in something the world has to give through some relationship with somebody, through a job, through a hobby, through money, through whatever it might be. God, remind them, show them that that's going to leave them a puddle in the street. Show them, Lord, that they need to turn from that, repent of their sin, repent of trying to fill their bucket with anything of the world, and turn and follow you in faith. We thank you that Jesus did for us what we could not do for ourselves when he died on the cross. He rose three days later, satisfying the perfect demands of God's righteousness on our behalf. Thank you, Lord, that we are not made right with you by anything we do, by being a good person but, Lord, we are made right with you, and we are given our eternal and abundant life because of what you have done and because of who you are, not because of who we are and what we have done. And I pray, Father, for anyone here that knows you today and loves you, but maybe they're at a place in their life where they're kind of bossing you around. Maybe they're at a place in life where uh, they, they think you, are, uh, you owe it to them. Maybe some are in the midst of drinking the cup and just need to be assured and reminded of your wonderful presence with them in the midst of that. So, Father, as we just contemplate, as we listen, as your Spirit speaks to us, as we respond to you today, speak to our hearts now. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we appreciate that message. Um, we're going to have a, uh, our song of response as we normally do. I want to encourage you to take that time where you're at to uh, sing out to the Lord, to, to go before Him in prayer, however the Lord's at work in your heart. Um, immediately after the service is over, I'm, as customary, will be available right up here. We'll be happy to visit with anyone that has questions about uh, what it is to follow Christ or if you want to express that desire and we can begin having that conversation or about what it means to be a part of, of this church family. I'd love to have that conversation with you. Um, before I ask you to stand and sing, let me just remind you about tonight. If you signed up to bring something food-wise, this is the one out of the four where it's church folks bringing stuff. If you signed up to bring either the soups, the chilies, or the side things, please make sure you do that and have that there by 445 so we can get going, uh, get everybody through the line and get going on time. All right? Would you go ahead and stand with me now, and let's sing together. Take my life and let Hey. 
take my hands and let them move at the impulse of thy love, at the impulse of thy love. Take my feet and let them be swift and See you tonight at 5 o'clock, choir. I'll see you at 4 o'clock. You are dismissed.